From the heart of the nation's capital, this week with ABC News Chief Washington Correspondent, George Stephanopoulos, live from the museum on Pennsylvania Avenue. Hello again, I hope you're enjoying this Memorial Day weekend. We're gonna begin today with the president's top military advisor, Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Welcome to this week. Thank you, George. And we have a lot to cover today, but I wanna begin with the debate that really consumed Washington this week, Guantanamo Bay, right. whether to close it, how to close it, what to do with the detainees, weigh in from the perspective of the U.S. military. Well, I've advocated for a long time now that it needs to be closed. Uh, President Obama made a decision very early uh, after his inauguration to do that uh, by next January, and we're all working very hard to meet that deadline. Uh, it, it, it focuses on very difficult issues of what you do with the, the detainees who are there, there's some really bad people there. Uh, and so figuring out how we're going to uh, keep them where they need to be, keep them off the battlefield, uh, as well as close uh, Gitmo itself, uh, is a real challenge. Let's talk about keeping them off the battlefield because a report, a Pentagon report uh, was released this week or leaked this week that said about 14 percent of the Guantanamo detainees have gone back to the battlefield. I'm trying to puzzle that out. Does that mean that it was a mistake? to let them go or that somehow they were radicalized inside Guantanamo, that something happened to them there? Well, there's been an increasing number of those who've returned to the battlefield over the last year or two. There's been hundreds and hundreds who've actually been released, uh, both from Guantanamo over time as well as other detention facilities in uh, Iraq and in Afghanistan. Uh, and I think uh, individuals make their best judgment about uh, where they are and certainly from a military perspective. Uh, my advice is to focus heavily on making sure that these individuals don't return. It's gone up in recent weeks, or I'm sorry, in recent months from a single digit number of five or six percent to the low teens as, as far as uh, my understanding of those who have returned. For those detainees that have to come to the United States eventually, if indeed uh, they do, would the best option be for them to be held in military prisons here in the United States? Uh, we're, we're working hard now to figure out what, uh, what the options are and what the best one uh, would be. And that really is a decision the president's going to have to make, uh, certainly in meeting this deadline of what we do. Uh, but I just want to reemphasize how, you know, the challenge associated with that, the need to really keep the bad guys off the battlefield and to properly detain these individuals. Uh, uh, as determined in, in this process. But that is everybody's big concern, at least it was expressed in the Congress this week, that somehow detainees would come to the United States and they would pose a danger. And the FBI director, uh, Robert Mueller, said this week they could pose a risk. Sure. I, I, I certain, I've, I've listened to all that, and I thought Secretary Gates also uh, captured it well, is you know, we have terrorists in jail right now, have had for some time. They're in supermax prisons. Uh, and they don't pose a threat. So that's certainly an option, but again, it's not one for me to decide. Uh, the Republican leader of the Senate was quoted in the New York Times uh, today saying there's actually a very slim possibility now that the Congress will allow Guantanamo to close. If he's right and Guantanamo doesn't close, what would that mean for your military mission? Well, the, the concern I've had about uh, Guantanamo uh, in these wars is it has been a symbol uh, and one which has uh, been a, a recruiting symbol for uh, those extremists and jihadists who would fight us. Uh, so, and I think that centers, you know, that's at the heart of, of uh, the concern for uh, Guantanamo's continued existence in which I spoke to a few years ago you know, and the need to close it. Former Vice President Cheney took on that debate this week. He was speaking uh, about Guantanamo, but also specifically the enhanced in interrogation techniques. And he took on this issue of what he called the recruitment tool mantra. Take a listen. This recruitment tool theory has become something of a mantra lately, including from the president himself. And after a familiar fashion, it excuses the violent and blames America for the evil that others do. It's another version of that same old refrain from the left, we brought it on ourselves. He's taking issue with your judgment. Well, I, again, it's, it's my judgment that it has had, has had an impact and, and uh, it's time to move on. And, and the difficulty of doing that is captured in the in the complexity of the issues, but I think we need to. Let me move on to the issue of, of Iran. Uh, you've said that Iran is on a path to building uh, nuclear weapons, but the 2007 National Intelligence Estimate concluded with a high degree of confidence that Iran had halted its nuclear weapons program. So do you believe that that 
intelligence estimate is outdated? Is it no longer accurate? Well, I, I believe then and I still believe that Iran's strategic objective is to achieve nuclear weapons and, and that that path continues. Their leadership is committed to it. They, had a, they conducted a missile test this, uh, this last week uh, that was successful, which, which continues to improve their missile uh, delivery system and capability. Uh, their, their intent seems very clear to me, and I'm one who believes if they achieve uh, that objective, that it is incredibly destabilizing for the region, and I think uh, eventually for the world. You said it's their intent, but do you believe they've restarted their actual nuclear weapons program? I haven't, uh, I haven't seen, uh, or I wouldn't speak to any details about what they are doing with respect to that, uh, although uh, I remain concerned that that uh, while intelligence estimates focus on uh, what we know, uh, I'm you know, concerned about what Iran might be doing that we don't know. Let, let me also press the question of their strategic intent. The Newsweek has a cover story out this morning. Let me show our, our viewers. It says that uh, everything you think you know about Iran is wrong. And one of the points uh, Fareed Zakaria makes in, in Newsweek is he points out that on several occasions over the last several years, Iran's leaders have said they are not interested in having nuclear weapons. They have said that nuclear weapons are immoral. The Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei actually issued a fatwa saying that these uh, weapons are indeed immoral. And I guess, obviously, it's very possible that they could just be lying. But it does seem odd that a country that the Islamic Republic, that bases its legitimacy on being a guardian of Islam, would develop weapons that it considers immoral. That would seem to undercut their own legitimacy. Well, I think that speaks to the importance of the dialogue uh, that President Obama uh, has uh, stated he wants to uh, initiate uh, and to really uh, ring out whether uh, that's how the Supreme Leader feels. Certainly from what I've seen in recent years, Iran's on a path to develop So you don't weapons. believe it, that they don't want nuclear weapons? Uh, at this point, no. And the chief of staff to Israel's defense minister, General Michael Herzog, has said that Iran could actually have its first nuclear weapon by the end of 2010 or the beginning of 2011. Do you agree with that? Well, I think you make certain assumptions about what they can do. Uh, most of us believe that it's, that it's uh, one to three years, uh, depending on uh, uh, assumptions about where they are right now. Uh, but they are moving closer, clearly. Uh, and they continue to do that. And if you believe their strategic intent, as I do, uh, and as certainly uh, my Israeli counterpart does, uh, that's the principal concern. And you just said that you believe that a nuclear run would be calamitous uh, for the region. But, but last year, Cy Hirsch in The New Yorker reported that you pushed back very hard against any notion of a military strike during President Bush's administration. And you've spoken publicly about the unintended consequences of a military strike right. by Israel. So uh, what worries you more, a, a nuclear Iran or war with Iran? Well, they both worry me a lot. And, and I think the unintended consequences of, of a strike uh, uh, against Iran right now uh, would be uh, incredibly uh, serious, uh, as well as the unintended consequences of their achieving uh, a nuclear weapon. And so that's why this Engagement and dialogue is, is so important. I think we, we should do that with all options on the table uh, as we approach them. Uh, and so that leaves a pretty narrow space in which to, to uh, achieve a successful dialogue and a successful outcome, which from my perspective means they don't end up with nuclear weapons. They don't end up with nuclear weapons, but could they have, as Japan does, a full nuclear fuel cycle program that's fully inspected? The, the, I, th I think that's certainly a possibility, and, and this isn't, at least from my perspective, from the military perspective, this isn't about them having uh, the ability to uh, produce nuclear power. It's about their desire and their goal uh, to have a nuclear weapon. Finally, if it comes to this, do you believe it's possible to take out Iran's program militarily at an acceptable cost? Um, I won't, you know, I won't speculate on what we can and can't do. Again, I put that in the category as of my, my very strong preference is to not be put in a position where we, where someone, uh, where uh, Iran is struck uh, in terms of taking out its nuclear capability. Okay, let me move to Iraq then. Uh, U.S. combat forces are scheduled to complete their pullout from Iraqi cities by June 30th, but in recent weeks we've seen an uptick again right. uh, in, in, in the violence. Does that rise in violence mean that, that the deadline for pulling American forces out of the cities might not 
be met? No, I think we're still very much on a track in terms of pulling the forces out of the cities, which is the end of, uh, end of next month. Uh, we're on track to, to uh, decrease the number of troops down to 35 to 50,000 in August of 2010. We've had an uptick in violence, but the overall violence levels are, are at the 2003 levels. It's still fragile. Uh, there's an awful lot of political uh, positioning and political debate that's going on right now, and I think that in great part becomes the essence of, of how Iraq moves forward. Uh, I'm actually positive uh, about what the Iraqi security forces have done, their army uh, and their police in terms of providing for their own security. They've improved dramatically. So the path, I think, is still the right path. Uh, these uh, these uh, ticks, upticks in, in violence uh, are going to occur. We said that going in, even into, as we talked about, coming down in force. So we just have to, we have to constantly keep an eye on that. Al-Qaeda is still active. They're not gone. They're very much Al diminished. Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, is very much diminished, uh, but they still have potential to create these kinds of uh, incidents. And the president has said that his overall goal is to have all forces out of Iraq by 2011. Under the status of forces agreement with the Iraqi government, I intend to remove all U.S. troops from Iraq by the end of 2011. That is pretty unequivocal. Yet I was reading the proceedings of the U.S. Naval Institute. They had an interview with Tom Ricks, the U.S. military historian, where he says he worries that the president is being wildly over-optimistic. He says we may be only halfway through the war. And he, he, he talks about a conversation he had with the commanding general in Iraq, General Ray Ordierno, who told him he'd like to see 35,000 troops in Iraq in 2015. Is that what you expect as well? Well, certainly the, the direction from the president and the status of forces agreement that we have with Iraq right now uh, is that we will have all troops out of there by the end of 2011, and that's what we're planning on right now. But can Iraq be safe with all U.S. troops out of Iraq in 2007? Well, we're on a, we're on a good path now, and, and we'll have to see. I mean, the, the next 12 to 18 months are really critical there in that regard, and I think that answering that question uh, will be much clearer uh, at, 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 given that time frame. The other thing is the, you know, we have, this is a long-term relationship we want with Iraq, uh, and Iraq has stated they want with the United States, and part of that is uh, the possibility that, that forces could remain there longer. But that's up to the Iraqi people and the Iraqi government to initiate discussions along those lines, and that hasn't happened it's yet. It's up to the Iraqi people, the Iraqi government, it's up to the president, of course, as well. But from a military perspective, General Ordierno says that he would like to see 35,000 troops in 2015. Is that what you all believe is necessary to secure Iraq from a military perspective? There's no definitive number right now uh, beyond the end of 2011. But and, it's not zero. Uh, well, I mean, uh, when I when I'm in uh, when I'm engaged in other countries around the world, I have very small footprints of military uh, personnel in that engagement. You know, and I would hope long term that we would have a great military military relationship with Iraq. That in, that could include U.S. troops there. Well, I mean, we've got small numbers of troops throughout the world that conduct training activities, exercises, and those kinds of things. So long term in Iraq, I would look to be able to do something like that. We're also increasing our troop presence, of course, in Afghanistan, right. and that's raised a lot of concern uh, in the Congress. Uh, recently, some members of Congress, leading members of Congress like Dave Obey, a chairman of the Appropriations Committee, saying he's willing to support funding now, but he's only going to give uh, you a year to show progress. Here's also what, what Congressman Jim McGovern of Massachusetts said on the floor. I'm not advocating for an immediate withdrawal of our military forces from Afghanistan. All I am asking for is a plan. If there is no military solution for Afghanistan, then please just tell me how we will know when our military contribution to the political solution has concluded? That, that's a great question. How will we know when the military contribution has been successful? Well, I think uh, the, as we move more forces into Afghanistan this year, literally uh, we're doing that as we speak, uh, that's absolutely necessary to provide, to, to turn the security situation around. But the military solution uh, is not enough. We've got to have uh, uh, government uh, governance capability increased dramatically. We've got to have development, economic development. Uh, we need more civilians from our government and, and civilians from other agencies in other countries as well. So it's the three-legged stool. It's development, it's rule of law and governance, uh, as well as security. 
Uh, and I think not unlike Iraq, we get security to a point where these other, uh, these other aspects can be developed uh, much more fully, and we'll know at that point in time uh, how far we've gone and what our next steps should be. But specifically, what can be achieved in the next year? Uh, I think uh, with the troops that we put uh, on the ground there that over the next 12 to 18 months we have to dramatically change the security situation uh, and stem the tide. We've had uh, an increasing level of violence in, in the last three years from uh, in 6, 7, and 8, and I think in 9 and 10 we have to start to turn that around. Let me talk about the issue of gays in the military. The president has told you that he wants to repeal the don't ask, don't tell policy so the gays and lesbians right. can serve openly in the military. And the Pentagon said this week that you personally, along with Secretary Gates, are working to address the challenges associated with implementing the president's commitment. What exactly are you doing and what exactly are you worried about? The president has made his strategic intent very clear that it's, it's his intent at some point in time to ask Congress to change this law. I think it's important to also know that this is the law, this isn't a policy, and that for, for the rules to change, a, a, a law has to be passed. And there's legislation introduced in the Congress there, now. And there that. is, exactly. And, and so uh, I've had uh, discussions with uh, the Joint Chiefs about this. I've done certainly a lot of internal uh, to immediate staff uh, discussions about what the issues would be uh, and how but we... what are they? What, what are the challenges? Well, the, I, the, the, it's my job as a senior military advisor to uh, provide best advice, best military advice to the president. And what I owe him is an objective assessment of what these changes would be, what they might impact on. And there could be speculation about what that might be, but my goal would be to achieve an objective assessment of, of the impact, if any, uh, of this kind of change. In addition, you know, I would need some time uh, for a force that's under a great deal of stress. We're in our, you know, sixth year of fighting two wars to, uh, to look at, if this change occurs, to look at uh, implementing it in a very deliberate, measured way. And, and uh, what I also owe the president, and I owe the men and women in uniform, is an impl implementation plan to, uh, to uh, achieve this based on a timeline that would be set, obviously, after the loss change. One of your predecessors, General John uh, Shalikashvili, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs back in the early 90s, uh, has said he has second thoughts uh, on this whole issue. Sure. Now, he was against uh, opening up services to gays and lesbians then. Now he's written, I now believe that if gay men and lesbians served openly in the United States military, they would not undermine the efficacy of the armed forces. Our military has been stretched thin by our deployments in the Middle East, and we must welcome the service of any American who is willing and able to do the job. Is he right? He's uh, certainly entitled to his, uh, his own uh, personal opinion, and, and certainly I have the greatest respect for him. Uh, there, are, there are also lots of uh, retired generals and admirals uh, on the other side. What's and your what opinion? I, what, I would, what I would hope to do in this, uh, George, again, given the strategic intent of the president, is to, uh, to avoid uh, a, a, a polarizing debate that puts a force that's very significantly under stress in the middle. And to get this, get to this, assuming the law uh, is going to change, in a, and again, a measured, deliberate way. Uh, and that, as the senior military leader, is what I consider my principal Measured, responsibility. Measured, deliberate way. So it sounds like if the Congress calls you up to testify in this law, you're going to say now is not the time to repeal? No, I actually, uh, uh, I'm going to talk to the process that we have in this country, which is we file the law, and if the law changes, we'll comply. There's absolutely no question about that. We have a couple minutes left. I want to ask you about working with President Obama as a commander-in-chief. Been do go doing it for about four months now, a little bit more than four months. What have you learned? about the president as commander and chief, and is he performing as you expected? It's, it's uh, uh, very rare in any, with any kind of major issue that uh, the president doesn't initially ask, okay, where are we going here? What's our end state? And, and then developing a strategic view of, of uh, how to get there and the major pieces with respect to that. Um, that that uh, he is developing policies and policy objectives that the military can support. And the policy and the strategy uh, are very clear. And, and I'm not a policy and a strategy guy. I'm, you know, the military basically supports what the president wants, uh, the decisions that he makes. And he's done that. He's done that in Iraq. He's done that in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, and I find that to be, to, to, to be uh, uh, a method that 
gives the military the kind of focus it needs for where we're going. Has he surprised you in any way? Um, no, not really. I mean, I met him, I met him before, the, uh, uh, I think a week or so after he was elected. We had very frank conversations about, uh, uh, about our, uh, our positions uh, on various issues in terms of uh, how we saw things. He was very clear about what he wants to do. He's a very bright, focused individual. He takes a diversity of opinion, and then he's, he's as every president is, you know, he's, he knows he has to make decisions. He's made them. He's made hard ones, and I think he will continue to do so. Finally, as you pointed out, the military has been under tremendous stress for the last eight years. Families have been separated again and again. Um, the suicide rate has risen pretty dramatically yeah. in the military. What do you want on this Memorial Day weekend? What do you want Americans to know about what the military is going through, and what do you want them to reflect on? Well, we do have a force that's pressed very, very hard. That said, they're the best military I have ever been associated with in my 41 years of wearing the uniform. They have performed incredibly. Uh, I, I would like America to uh, remember those who've served and those that we've lost and their families uh, I would like to, there's tremendous resolve in our military. We're fighting two wars, uh, and the, the goal to win and succeed in these wars uh, is resident throughout our military and, and the capability to do that, uh, and, that we, and that we are resolved to, as a country to support those who've given so much, those who've fallen, families of the fallen, and those who've been wounded. And communities throughout the land reach out to these young people who have gone forward sacrifice greatly uh, and uh, and have rich lives that they look forward to uh, even though their path on getting there may have changed because they've been wounded uh, injuries seen and unseen but they're great americans and we need to take care of them. and we will remember all that tomorrow admiral thank you very much thank you george